Now to those remarks by President Clinton's attorney, Robert Bennett. He spoke this week at the City Club of Chicago. Uh, without further ado, I want to salute the young man who has given a new energy, a new vision, a new drive, and he's not even running for president of the United States, but he is president of the City Club of Chicago. He's the person who has revitalized this group and has made it the peer, the, in fact, the premier among peers, but the premier civic organization in Chicago and the Midwest. I give you Jay Doherty. Thank you, Tom Roser, very, very much. First of all, I wanted to thank Tom, who served so ably as president of the City Club for 17 years prior to assuming the chairmanship. So on behalf of the City Club of Chicago, why don't we give Tom Roser a wonderful hand. <coughs> thank you, Tom. Uh, before we start, I wanted to thank C-SPAN for covering today's presentation by our featured speaker, Bob Bennett, and other distinguished members of the media. I also wanted to mention a few special friends of the City Club before I introduce our guest. Uh, a very quiet member uh, who's very generous to the City Club, my partner, Tom Coffey. Tom? <laughs> and from the Chicago Tribune, the writer of the Ink column, Mike Conklin. Mike? Former, former federal judge, partner at Skadden Arps, Susan Getzendanner. Justice, Susan? The incomparable voice of the Chicago Tribune, John Cass. John? The alderman of the 49th ward, Joe Moore. Alderman? <clears throat> He's here somewhere. And the alderman of the super ward, the wealthiest ward in the United States of America, Alderman Burt Nataris. <clears throat> I know. Took my breath away, Bert. Uh, distinguished civic and charitable leader for many, many years and a great friend of the City Club of Chicago, Chicago Pat O'Malley. Pat? <laughs> Senior corporate partner of Skadden Arps, Chip Mullaney. Chip? All of us are involved in one way or another in government and politics, but this person devotes his life to humanity. Father David Ryan. Father Ryan from Maryville. Another quiet and very generous supporter of the City Club of Chicago, Wayne Whalen. Wayne. For decades, one name dominated the legal and political news in Washington, particularly when a high-profile criminal case loomed against a headline-grabbing political powerhouse. That name was Edward Bennett Williams. I think the name Edward Bennett Williams had the same cachet in his era that Clarence Darrow probably had in his times. Both had remarkable records of acquittals, remarkable in that they secured so many acquittals. Remarkable because almost invariably the daily news accounts spelled doom 
for the defendant. But Edward Bennett Williams left us more than a decade ago. And until now, his shoes, his roles have gone unfilled until now. Oh, there may have been some pretenders, but they turned out to be here and gone. But if there is a real candidate for that ongoing Williams High Wire Act, that man is here with us today. Not surprising, our guest today has superb credentials. Just what you would expect of a defender of the President of the United States, a bachelor's degree from Georgetown University, two years at the University of Virginia Law School, his LLB from the Georgetown Law Center, and his LLM from Harvard Law School a year later. On his way up, our guest today was an assistant United States attorney for the District of Columbia, special counsel for a U.S. Senate Select Committee on Ethics, a special counsel for the District of Columbia, and a legal advisor to the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee. More recently, he represented the chairman of the U.S. House Ways and Means Committee, Dan Rostenkowski, and more recently, attorney for the President of the United States. Not a bad client roster. Edward Bennett Williams' clients, in case you may not remember, included Senator Joe McCarthy, Texas Governor John Connolly, Jimmy Hoffa, and many other certifiable characters. But even Edward Bennett Williams did not have the President of the United States as his client. Therein, our guest today stands alone. When our guest is not advising the President of the United States, he represents corporations, directors, and officers in civil and criminal matters. He advises management and boards of directors on preventive and remedial measures. He also assists in performing internal investigations for purposes of defending against criminal charges, shareholder suits, and other similar private sector matters. In short, ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is fairly described as a heavy hitter. I would be ter terribly remiss if I did not also mention that our guest is a partner in the law firm of Skadden Arps, Slate, Maher, and Flom. Remiss is hardly the word. My personal guest at our table, and also a very great friend, personally, and also of the City Club, quiet and very generous, is a managing partner of Skadden Arps in Chicago, Wayne Whalen. Wayne? I told you it was quiet. At Skadden Arps, our guest today heads the firm's International Government Enforcement Group, and he leads the civil litigation practice of his firm's Washington office. It suddenly occurs to me, do you know what would be one of the great all-time indoor sports shows? It would be our guest, a former boxer, squaring off against Kenneth Starr. Skadden Arps versus Kirkland and Ellis. I can see and hear the collision now. I can see the battle lines forming. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the City Club of Chicago, Bob Bennett. Bob?
Nice introduction, Jay. I'd like to bring you along on all the other speeches that I give. <clears throat> it's lucky it wasn't under oath, though. Uh, uh, I, I am indeed very flattered to uh, be invited to speak today. And I, I was given two instructions by Jay. He said he wanted me to be substantive. And second, I had to do it under 30 minutes. So uh, I certainly promise you I will be under 30 minutes, and I, I hope you find it substantive. Uh, but I want to thank you for having me, because what this did is it sort of forced me to sort of take some time out from <clears throat> putting out fires and thinking a little bit about uh, what I've been involved in uh, over the last several years. And. Uh, I'd like to share some of those observations with you. And I suppose if I do my job right, I will manage to offend just about everybody. Uh, for the past 30 years, I've had a, a ringside seat at uh, many of our nation's scandals <clears throat> involving political figures. And over that period of time, I've observed firsthand the very steady deterioration of the public's respect for government and its political leaders. And I've witnessed firsthand the pollution of our legal and congressional processes caused by intense and unreasonable partisan politics. We have my, <clears throat> my friends in this country uh, created a destructive and a corrosive scandal machine which unfortunately threatens to become a permanent part of our landscape. And let me, let me tell you how it works. Uh, journalists, through their stories, uh, often based on anonymous sources, rumor, unsubstantiated facts, damage innocent persons and cause Congress and the public to demand investigations and hearings. Prosecutors and investigators selectively leak information to favor journalists to publicize their cases and do great harm and damage to their targets. And members of Congress view splashy public hearings <clears throat> and the appointment of special counsels as vehicles for political gain. <coughs> Excuse me. The resulting investigations conducted by independent counsel or congressional committees are billed as impartial fact-finding missions, but they're often little more than witch hunts designed to harm and humiliate the targets of the inquiries and the opposition party. They disregard the rights of privacy and make a sham out of grand jury secrecy. This scandal machine often bankrupts individuals who are little more than pawns in a larger political agenda, and it threatens the ability of the political system to attract and retain the bright, dedicated people that our nation needs and deserves. But most significantly, in my opinion, it undermines public confidence in our government, its leaders, and the criminal and legislative processes. And in my judgment, the crisis is getting worse. And we should ask, <clears throat> why is this happening? Because Republicans and Democrats alike have for partisan advantage and without restraint politicized the processes that are designed to resolve legal and ethical disputes, we are in this problem. We've all witnessed the phenomenon. The ethics committee that divides along party lines on virtually every issue, although what is right and wrong ethically should not be a matter of party affiliation. 
And we are now witnessing a highly partisan fight on something so important and so delicate as an impeachment inquiry. The disagreements are not simply about substantive matters, but each side is questioning the good faith and credibility of the other, and it reeks with animosity on both sides. We have frequently heard the call by partisan members of Congress for a criminal investigation by an independent counsel or for a high-profile congressional investigation at the slightest whiff of scandal, no matter how minor or unsubstantiated the allegations. The partisans know that the mere request for an independent counsel or congressional investigation will unleash the media-driven scandal machine. And the appointment of a counsel under the hair-trigger provisions of the Independent Counsel Act or the opening of a congressional investigation will put it in overdrive. The competition for viewers, readers, and ratings by the entire news media, especially the 24-hour-a-day cable news shows, where news has become primarily entertainment, where rumor is reported as fact, where tabloid trash is repeated as serious news, has all resulted in a loss of rationality and proportionality and has cheapened the honorable and important profession of news gathering and reporting. For 24 hours a day, we can watch TV pundits primarily self-promoting lawyers, so-called experts, market themselves on television by opining on cases they are not involved in and provide so-called expert opinion on events they have no knowledge about, have no responsibility for, and who have no limits placed upon them by the facts of the case or the wishes of a client. Partisan investigations have become far too common. So common, in fact, that we no longer appreciate how damaging they can be. Not only to innocent people who are trapped in these investigations within this scandal machine, but the entire political system and our constitutional way of life. The scandal machine as we know it today was born in the Watergate era. Watergate, which focused on President Nixon, and his firing of investigating counsel. This was our first great modern political scandal. And as a result, Americans became much less willing to trust their elected leaders and much more willing, indeed eager, to believe that they were involved in unethical or illegal activities. Congress also became much, much more willing to launch public investigations into the executive branch, and new ethics laws were passed, creating the potential for still more investigations. And the press became much more aggressive in reporting on these potential scandals, and in an effort to become the Woodward or Bernstein of Watergate fame, many young reporters, without a sense of history, context, or proportion, saw a scandal where it did not exist or treated any mistake, no matter how minor or factually soft, as a scandal worthy to be called a gate of some time, kind. Thus, we've had Iran gate, Iraq gate, travel gate, cattle gate, file gate, China gate, and now we're in the midst of Monica gate. As a result of Watergate, <clears throat> the executive branch would no longer be trusted to police itself. The Ethics and Government Act of 1978 created the Office of Independent Counsel, a prosecutor appointed by a panel of judges and for all practical purposes accountable to no one. This independent counsel has an unlimited budget, can investigate whatever they want, and as you know, those of you who are lawyers, you must beware of the lawyer with one case and an endlessly deep pocket to finance it. 
We now have the spectacle in our country of seven or eight independent councils working in Washington, spending millions and millions of taxpayer dollars to investigate public officials. These are often routine and ordinary matters that are more properly investigated by the Department of Justice. Now, you must understand that there is great hypocrisy on both sides of the aisle. The Republicans were highly critical of the independent counsel statute, as they should have been, when my client, Casper Weinberger, was in the crosshairs of an independent counsel. But they don't think it's such a bad idea now that President Clinton is on the receiving end. And the Democrats, who are now so critical of the statute, gave it a new life when they supported its renewal. Hopefully, both sides will call a truce and will kill this monster they created when the statute comes up for renewal next year. The changes since Watergate <clears throat> have been enormous, the cultural changes. Watergate taught both political parties that scandal could serve as a shortcut to political success. The lesson was learned. Allegations of criminal wrongdoing or ethical breaches consumed by a hungry press could achieve immediate political results. Since Watergate, both parties, both parties have eagerly looked for wrongdoing, but only, it seems, by members of the opposite party. It seems so much easier than old-fashioned politics. Discredit your opponent by attacking his or her character or accuse your opponent of a crime or ethical breach and thereby tie him or her up with subpoenas and prosecutors. The real agenda for many of those who pursue these investigations and encourage them has little, if any, connection to the supposed scandal being investigated. Instead, the real agenda is to achieve political power by causing one's political opponents to be investigated and publicly embarrassed. In all of this, the individual in the crosshairs of the prosecutor or congressional investigator is treated like a wounded animal hounded by a pack of wolves made up by members of the press, partisan politicians, or an unaccountable independent counsel or congressional investigator. The basis for the most serious charges against Mr. Weinberger, for example, had nothing to do with Iran or hostages or sending weapons to Central America. Instead, the principal issue as to Mr. Weinberger was whether he misled investigators by not providing notes to government investigators. Notes, by the way, which were readily accessible in the Library of Congress. No responsible professional prosecutor would have pursued Cap Weinberger, but the Independent Counsel's Office launched an attack that seriously threatened the reputation of an honorable statesman and public servant who had done nothing wrong. The Independent Counsel, Mr. Walsh, was in office as an Independent Counsel for seven years longer than all but three attorney generals in the history of our country. The independent counsel's real target was not Weinberg. He was a means to an end. The real target was Ronald Reagan. In that effort, the independent counsel, in my presence, offered Mr. Weinberger a no-jail misdemeanor plea, which usually in my business is a very good result, if he turned on the president. And Mr. Weinberger rejected that offer, was indicted on multiple felony counts, and as you know, the matter was pardoned. He was pardoned before trial. And now Mr. Clinton is the target. To investigate Mr. Clinton, Kenneth Starr, a well-known conservative, was appointed to investigate Mr. Clinton when Mr. Robert Fisk was removed on a very technical argument that there was an appearance of a conflict of interest because he was appointed as a special counsel by Attorney General Reno. This appointment set off criticism from Democrats 
who justifiably claim that Mr. Starr was very partisan, was appointed under questionable circumstances, and was nowhere near as experienced as Bob Fisk, his predecessor, who was experienced in these types of investigations, being the former United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York. Now, I will not <clears throat> use this forum, I don't think it appropriate to do so, to advance my defense of President Clinton. But whether you praise Mr. Starr or whether you criticize him, you simply cannot dispute that his appointment as independent counsel and the manner in which it occurred and the way it has been handled has failed to serve a key purpose of the statute. That is to remove the appearance of partisanship from the prosecutorial process. Only yesterday it has been reported that prior to his appointment as independent counsel, Mr. Starr served as a consultant to the attorneys for Paula Jones. Mr. Davis, one of the former attorneys of, uh, for Paula Jones, went on television for whatever reasons I don't understand yesterday and said that he had conferred with Mr. Starr on as many as six separate occasions consulting with him about his uh, representation of Ms. Jones and seeking guidance from him. Uh, this certainly raises a very serious, if true, appearance issue, one far more serious than the removal that was the basis for the removal of Mr. Fisk. That is particularly true since Mr. Starr expanded his, his jurisdiction to essentially hijack the Paula Jones case without, I am told by news reports, if true, he never notified either the Attorney General of his relationship with Mr. Davis and his firm, nor did he advise the three-judge court. I don't know if that's true. Let me make that perfectly clear. If it is true, it is a very serious matter, particularly when the appearance of conflict is at the core of why we have an independent counsel statute and why we don't let that Department of Justice uh, be the investigatory agency. A criminal or congressional investigation is simply not an appropriate place for partisan politics. And a partisan political forum is simply not the place to conduct quasi-judicial investigations. Partisan investigations have real costs for individuals and for our country as a whole. Perhaps the most uh, personal and poignant costs are those paid by the men and women unfortunate enough to become ensnarled in the modern scandal machine, who often, as I say, on the basis of rumor, are pulled into these things. But you do not even have to be the target of one of these investigations to have your life turned upside down and your targets, uh, pockets empty. If any of you have ever consider uh, accepting an appointment to the White House or other prestigious federal job, you can, should consider the case of Harold Ickes, who I understand spoke to you uh, uh, last week. Now, I understand he told you how expensive I was. Uh, I'm sure he didn't tell you how much I've been paid, though. But anyway, that's... <laughs> uh, but seriously, Mr. Ickes was a committed public servant. A servant. At all times, he's been a witness, and we've had unbelievable interview after interview, grand jury appearance after grand jury appearance. We've run up literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in hard, out-of-pocket expenses reproducing documents and things of that kind. And he's a guy who came to Washington to do, do, do the public good. Uh, another a former advisor to President Clinton, a friend of mine, George Stephanopoulos, uh, said to me as he was leaving Washington, he said that he, he considered his run in Washington an enormous success because his legal fees were just under $100,000. And he thought that that was, that was pretty good and George was not the subject or target of anything. Um, he was half joking, but, but only half joking. Uh, uh, Congress too, <clears throat> I should point out, and I think this is very important, 
is harmed by this culture of scandal. Uh, one of Congress's most important powers is the power to investigate. And I can tell you, uh, as counsel to certain Senate committees, the Senate Ethics Committee, several cases involving both Republicans and Democrats uh, who have been under investigation, I've seen this firsthand. But in recent years, Congress has allowed its investigative and oversight authority to be used for primarily partisan purposes. Only recently, the House Oversight Committee on party lines voted to hold Attorney General Reno in contempt for not doing what uh, they wanted her to do. Now, th this is really separating politics uh, uh, from law enforcement. I, I don't understand it. Uh, this politicalization of the law enforcement decision-making process is nothing short of an outrage and a danger. Politics uh, should not interfere with the investigatory process. And I think as a result of all of this, the voters just look at congressional investigations as simply one more form of partisan bickering, and therefore they have lost uh, interest in such, in, in, in such investigations. Uh, the constant drumbeat of investigations from Washington uh, leave the impression that almost everyone seems to be under some type of investigation. And it's persuaded many, many Americans that everyone in government and politics is corrupt, that everyone is tainted. Uh, Minority Leader Gebhardt recently has testified that there were 45 separate investigations, 45 going on in the House of Representatives at this time involving the Democratic administration. Uh, it's no wonder that there's not enough time to get any real work done. Uh, this is an abuse of power. It's a waste of limited resources, resources which should be spent on solving the problems facing our country and our world. Uh, constant complaints from partisans that our Justice Department cannot be relied on to investigate high-profile matters professionally and independently, combined with this quick fix of independent counsel, has eroded public confidence in our executive branch and law enforcement institutions, which have really served our country uh, quite well since the beginning. Uh, these changes in, in the way Americans feel about their government is one of the most significant changes of the last 25 years uh, since Watergate. It, it's little wonder that when you look at the national opinion po surveys and polls that gauge the public's confidence in our institutions, we find that Congress remains at the bottom of public trust and that next to the bottom, one step up, is the executive branch. Now, I don't maintain that everyone in politics is fully devoted to the public good and has never sinned. But it is a real mistake for us, to, for any of us, liberal, conservative, moderate, Republican, Democrat, to see conspiracies around every corner and to assume that every politician is corrupt. Indeed, in my opinion, having worked on, on as, as investigating counsel in many cases, it is my view that Congress today and politicians in general today are far more ethical and far less corrupt than any, almost any time in the history of our country. And I, I do think uh, our press deserves a great deal of, 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 of compliment for that too, because while there have been terrible excesses, I think our press has kept helped keep this a very honest country. But you would never know, if I'm right, you would never know that politicians are more honest today. And that's because the politicalization of the legal and political processes, the ethical processes, paint a very false and a very disfigured picture of contemporary American politics. We have allowed the acid of cynicism to destroy uh, politics as a profession before our very eyes. Uh, members of Congress must recognize 
that those who disagree with them are not always criminals and their conduct does not always merit investigation. They should extend to their political opponents the same assumption of integrity that they would ask for themselves. It seems that when a politician helps a contributor, he's engaging in the time-honored practice of constituent service. But when your political opponent does it, you call it a payoff and demand an investigation. And this isn't right. A uh, writer for U.S. News, <clears throat> I think Ronald Brownstein in a, in a recent article just captured my point better than I can. He said, both parties are now locked into an escalating cycle of atrocity and revenge reminiscent of an ethnic war. Um, now, my brother always quotes the Federalist Papers, so I felt that I was going to do that too, but I'm only doing it on the provision you don't ask me any questions about the Federalist Papers, because he, he's, the, he's, he's the virtuous intellect in my family. I may be older and wiser, but he's the virtuous intellect. Uh, seriously, in, in the Federalist, James Madison said this, it's a wonderful quote. He said that uh, if the governed were angels, no government would be necessary and that if angels were to govern, no controls on government would be necessary. And Chekhov once said, he said, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. And I think we've got to remember that. We must realize that our political leaders are neither angels nor are they devils. The leaders of both parties and their, and their soldiers must call a truce. They must stop seeking political gain by reckless allegations of criminal and ethical wrongdoing. We must all recognize that our government is made up largely of men and women, both Republicans and Democrats, who don't deserve the hell that partisanship has wrought upon them. My friends, we live in a, in a very dangerous and a very challenging world. Uh, much more dangerous now that we don't have the Soviet Union uh, as a solidified, uh, identifiable entity, in a sense. Our, there are problems all over our world just crying out for solution. They're not getting the attention. They don't get the attention from government. They don't get the attention from the press. Our elected representatives must be permitted to do their jobs the jobs that they were chosen to do, and not be tied up in these endless scandal machine investigations. Uh, I believe deeply that the well-being of our country uh, really requires this. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, I figured after a light meal you should... <laughs> much, Mr. Bennett. We'll have some questions. The ground rules are these, that the media will uh, be subordinate to the members and guests of the City Club. All in favor of that, say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. The, <laughs> the first question I have, incidentally, Mr. Licklider, our executive director, has a roving microphone, and uh, he will uh, call upon you when you raise your hand. Then you will announce your name, if you would, and uh, the first question would be mine, and my question is, with regard to the independent prosecutor, what changes would you prescribe in that, or would you agree that it should be abolished and returned to the idea of a special prosecutor under which President Nixon was satisfactorily handled? Uh, I think it should be completely eliminated. In the unusual event where you feel the Department of Justice, for conflict reasons, can't handle it, such as the investigation of the Attorney General or or a president, uh, you can use a special counsel as, as was done in, 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 in Watergate. But uh, I think that that is for a rare situation. Now, if, if, if the statute is renewed, 
and it is not eliminated, uh, I think at a minimum they have to do some very serious things. First of all, uh, I believe that you should limit the number of the classes of people to be investigated. I mean, there is absolutely no reason in the world why you have to, why Henry Cisneros has to be the subject of an independent counsel investigation. Uh, he's the former cabinet officer who said he lied to the FBI about how much money he was paying a mistress. I mean, the Justice Department should be investigating that, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, there was an investigation about one of uh, 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 Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, aides uh, about whether he sniffed cocaine uh, at a bar or something. I mean, this is nonsense. We should limit it to the, just the very top level of, 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 of people. Uh, secondly, I believe it should be limited to abuse of power in office. Uh, I, I just think it's a form of insanity to have an independent counsel to go back, and, and uh, maybe I'm a partisan on this or an advocate on this, to find out if a president did something he shouldn't have done uh, 15 years ago in a real estate deal in Arkansas. And then when you don't find much there, you move on to something else, and you move on to something else, and then you wind up in the bedroom. Uh, I don't think that this is what the statute, uh, what the statute is all about. I think you should limit it to, to, to abuse of power in office. I think they should be limited in the amount of time. I think they should be somewhat limited in terms of, 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 uh, of money. And I think the hair trigger provisions should be eliminated. What I mean by that is you should give the Department of Justice uh, a real opportunity to investigate before they uh, have to uh, pick such uh, an independent counsel. Right now, Janet Reno essentially has to recommend a counsel unless she concludes that no further investigation is warranted. And she's not even given the tools this, uh, that she would normally have to make that determination. And that's a very low threshold, especially in these kinds of cases. So th those are just some of the, some of the suggestions that, that I think. I mean, it, it's really a practical human nature problem as much as anything. You, you, you pick an independent counsel, and the first thing they do, literally, is they come to Washington and they rent office space. Because there's no government space available. All the government, so they take out a big lease. And they get 25 agents, 40 agents, to start investigating. And it takes a very rare person to say after a year or two, hey, I didn't find anything. OK, question? It just doesn't work that way. Yes, sir. Mr. Bennett, assuming that the independent counsel or his underlings knew. Uh, your name, please? Oh, Brian Bernardoni. Assuming that the independent counsel or his underlings knew or planned the proliferation of the leaks, uh, throughout the investigation of the president, is it appropriate that the Office of Independence, Independent Counsel uh, be a target of, of a different investigation or possible disbarment type proceedings? And who would, under, under the way the law is written, have the authority to do that? Well, there, there, I, I'm going to limit my remarks to what's in the public record. In the public record, such investigations are being conducted. There are news reports indicating that Janet Reno is looking into, into this, and there have been some republic, public reports that uh, Chief Judge Johnson in the United States District Court is looking into, into these issues. Uh, uh, the bar, uh, any lawyer is subject to whatever bar they're in, and uh, the bar would be another, another avenue, but usually the bar waits on these things until the more formal inquiries are looked at. But I, I really can't go beyond what's in the public record. Tina Marie Adams. Uh, Mr. Bennett, you, you talked about the media-driven scandal machine, but you also talked about the media having kept today's politicians more honest. How do you resolve that discrepancy, or do you see there being a middle ground? Yeah, I mean, we all love to resolve discrepancies, but there are discrepancies in life. Uh, uh, let me make, let me preface it by saying uh, I am a great admirer of the press. I, I, I truly am. I mean, I really believe we have much less corruption in this country because of the press. But it, it's kind of not fair to say the press. The, it's a lot of, the press is a lot of different things. 
and I would be the last person I would fight before I permitted any outside force, particularly the government, to restrain the press. But I plead that the press restrain themselves. And when I say press, I mean those aspects of the press that engage in the excesses. I mean, and my particular targets are these, these cable shows, these 24-hour uh, cable shows that, you know, the normal sourcing doesn't take place. Now, I think it's not just that. I, I think a lot of the mainline press deserves some criticism uh, for their handling of this case. The, the Pew report came out, and, 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 and it's, a, it's made up really of, of superstar, ex-superstar media people and press people who found that most of the sourcing in, 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 in this case, in the Clinton case, was far below, far below normal standards. But that's a broad brush and, and and there are a lot of there are a lot of great reporters who do great work who that still uphold uh, the the standards of the profession the problem is is you know, let me give you an analogy and and, and I, you know really i think is a good one uh, i'm i'm a moderately neat person although my wife would disagree with that vehemently but i think i'm moderately neat and i lived with three other guys in law school and Two of them were really neat, neat, neat. We had one guy who was just a total slob. And by the time we lived together for six months, the place was a pigsty because I said, well, I'm not going to dump the garbage. He, dump, he didn't dump it his day. And that's what's happening in the press, that, that, that these cable shows go on. They have a bottomless pit. The news cycle is so quick. Everything is out there. Nobody wants to get scooped. Uh, the, the, the time to get your story, get your sourcing, is, is shortened now. And, 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 and it all filters down. And, and I think you see a lot of the, uh, the, the reporting now, and the news reporting, and even on the main ABC, NBC, CBS, they shoot off on stuff without doing uh, a, the kind of sourcing that five years ago or ten years ago they would have done. I'm not doing a broad brush criticism of them because many of the much of the reporting uh, uh, is good but but the press are easy to bash and I, I think they should be bashed where you know where it's where it's appropriate but let me tell you one little story which I'll never forget as long as I live which which uh, it I was just being a smart ass uh, I, 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 I serve as an advisor to the government of Georgia not not the state but the former part of the Soviet Union. And Mr. Shevardnadze invited me to come over there, my wife and I, and spend some time. And we had the pleasure of meeting with him. And as I came out of his office, uh, there was a camera crew. And they shoved a microphone in my face. Now, what you got to understand is what Georgia is doing today, it's like 1776. I mean, these are like patriots running around trying to adopt our constitutional provisions, trying to adopt our court systems, and, and, and so forth. And uh, I gave what I, having left Mr. Shevardnadze's office, I gave, you know, a few appropriate comments. And I, the head of parliament came up to me, we chatted, and I made a smarty pants remark. I said, you know, it's wonderful that you all are doing trying to model yourselves after the United States. But I said, don't do what we do with the press and the media. You know, don't let them up here like that. And he looked at me and he said, you know, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. He said, Bob, it's a lot better than what we had before when tomorrow's news is written today and written by certain officials who tell. And, you know, and it was a, you know, and I, I kind of said, yeah, 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 you're right. So, you got a question over there. Uh, Hal Burke is my name. Mr. Bennett, uh, I certainly uh, don't uh, think that you are your brother's keeper. But uh, it does seem to me that he might be outraged at uh, what I perceive to be a reasoned purview of uh, the politician's plight. I think a lot of us would like to know how you fellas get along with each other. Well, let me put it, we get along very well. We, we, we are very close to each other. 
Uh, we have a good arrangement going. He goes after all my clients and gets on television. And I mean, it's not. Uh, he has he has his job to do, and I have I have mine. We we get together. Maybe the best answer is this. I shouldn't I shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to tell you this because it's it's on me actually. Uh, let me put it. We, we we were having dinner at one of the prominent Washington restaurants, and the maitre d came up, and he said, you know. Don't be offended, but when you guys eat here, the cow's an endangered species. So uh, I think that's the point. We, we, you know, we have some disagreements, but, uh, but he has his job to do and I have mine to do. Question? <clears throat> My name is Chris Cohen. I'm uh, Bert Nateris's bodyguard. Um, I think... Uh, I think you should uh, 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 do us a great public service by letting uh, Chairman Roser or uh, your partner Wayne Whalen uh, mail out your speech today to paid members of the City Club. It's an excellent job. Thank you. Um, I am curious about the following. Prior to the special prosecutors asking Linda Tripp to wear a wire, uh, in your opinion, uh, did she uh, violate Maryland's eavesdropping law? And is there a sanction or a cause of action against the special prosecutor for using illegally obtained evidence? I, I can't answer that. Uh, she is, it's public information that she's under investigation by the Maryland uh, State Prosecutor's Office. Uh, why I, I can't answer it is in the statute, uh, there has to be a knowing violation. Uh, the press has reported that uh, employees of the store where she purchased it. Uh, at least one of them advised, advised her. They had a standard advisory, either orally or in writing. But that's under investigation now. Uh, uh, I, I, I have no reason. You know, I'm troubled about uh, Mr. Starr's wiring before he had authority to get into that part of the case. Uh, I have known Ken Starr for a long time, and while I am a critic of Mr. Starr in some respects, I am absolutely confident that Kenneth Starr would not knowingly, uh, intentionally uh, break the law. I have no doubt about that. Uh, that's not to say that I, I agree with what he has has done. I do not think the vast power of the independent counsel uh, should be used uh, uh, in, a, in what is essentially a sex case. And, and, and when people say, well, it's not a sex case, it's, it's whether uh, it's a perjury case or an obstruction case, I would remind you that the wiring took place before there was any testimony. So uh, I think that the notion in this country, and I really feel I'm not a partisan. I represent political figures uh, and actually sometimes get paying clients from companies. So if there are any corporate people here, I, I don't just do politics. Uh, um, you know, I mean, it's pretty scary when you think about, you know, every, every president has a past. Every president has a sex life or, you know, some may be more embarrassed by the absence of one, so they don't want it coming out either. I mean, I mean, Dan Quayle, remember, raced out there after my brother said that the, every politician will be asked uh, whether or not uh, they've had extramarital affairs, and the next day Quayle's out there saying, I didn't have, I didn't have. And, uh, I mean, everybody believed them, so I don't know why he would. But, but, but I don't think this is the stuff that should be going on. I mean, every president either was in education or in business. So you get in a commercial dispute and then somebody says, well, they lied in the deposition. Uh, Mr. Bush owns a football team. Uh, here's a lawsuit against his football team. Oh, and he lied in his deposition. So, I, I mean, I, I think we have to be really careful. And, and uh, 
And, and I think it's a very dangerous, a very dangerous business. Well, Mr. Bennett, uh, what you just talked about is a perfect entree to my question. My name is Andy Shaw. I'm with the ABC station here in Chicago. Just about an hour ago here in Chicago, Eleanor Smeal, the former president of NOW, the National Organization of Women, um, said at a news conference that um, Henry Hyde should not be sitting in judgment of Mr. Clinton because Henry Hyde has acknowledged to have engaged in activity or behavior that's not that dissimilar to, from Mr. Clinton's to which, of course, Henry Hyde takes exception. I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are as a lawyer about the ability of Mr. Hyde and others uh, who've acknowledged indiscretions to sit in judgment of what you've just described as a case uh, which is rooted in indiscretion. I, I you know, uh, I think all of this is part of what I'm, what I am, what I am talking about. Uh, I would not have criticized Chairman Hyde uh, on that basis. And I am enormously troubled if what we are going to do now is the era of sexual politics, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think John Tower was treated appropriately. I don't think Clarence Thomas was uh, treated appropriately. And I don't think uh, President uh, Clinton has been treated appropriately. Let me ask you a question, uh, uh, Mr. Bennett. Uh, uh, you are non-judgmental about Mr. Hyde, but there has been a critic of yours whom maybe you are judgmental about, and that is a legal scholar, Mr. Dershowitz, who has criticized you. You might want to comment about his critiques. I, I you know, I don't. Um, <laughs> my, my mother said, if you it wasn't it in that movie? What was that movie? Bambi, if Thumper said, if you can't say something nice about somebody, don't say anything at all. <laughs> so let's, I'm going to use the Bambi defense. Look, um, you know, I, I don't want to personalize it, uh, personalize it to him in a public forum, but look, uh, this gets to some of the pundits. I mean, I've been complimented for things that I didn't even think of doing. So, I mean, they were wrong, too. Uh, look, it's very easy when you are sitting in an ivory tower and you don't have the responsibility of a client and you don't have the responsibility of knowing the facts to get out and opine and let your imagination, you know, just run. And I would have done this and I would have, would have done that. And, so many of these pundits, um, uh, you, know, you know, do that, and I, I you know, I don't think it's, uh, it contributes very much, and, and most of these pundits, you know, including the one you mentioned, they really don't get in the pit, and they don't really get in the fight, and they don't really, they kind of come in after the fact and, and sort of pick at things, but, uh, but, you know. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, uh, we know that the White House is famous for its coffee, and uh, we want to extend to you on behalf of the City Club a mug that you can use any time, and uh, it's not very much of an honorarium, but it's deeply felt. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Okay.